the Lord's Prayer. And this is a prayer, I'm sure, that's something that all of you have at least heard of, even if you're not a regular Bible reader. I myself remember having to recite this in school assemblies with all my fellow students, and I'm sure many of them did not have the same Christian upbringing that I had. Thinking back, I wonder how many actually understood the words that, were, that they were saying and the Bible teaching that they contain. And so looking at this reading, it would appear on the surface that Jesus Christ is giving this prayer as a template. And so here we have the whole prayer on the screen for you now um, with a very basic structure. You've got the praise, the petition, and more praise. And we, and we start, don't we, often with our, our prayers, with praise and reverence to God. And then we petition for things that we want, the kingdom, our daily provisions, forgiveness for our confessed sins, and for guidance in future temptations. And then finally, some more praise. There's a very basic structure that I've deliberately shown to highlight the point that this prayer is not about this. It's not about a tick box exercise. We've got to get the praise in before we can ask for all the things we want. As a comparison to other prayers found in the Bible, it is relatively short. It's only five verses compared to some of the uh, immensely long psalms that we have recorded for us. What, what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, the audience that he is talking to uh, in the, in at this time, is that to effectively speak with God in prayer, we need to show that we understand the message that is given to us from his holy word, the Bible. And so here again is the whole prayer uh, with different colours. Uh, looks like it's coming through okay. Um, and they, the, the colours don't uh, tie together. There's just to differentiate each, sec each section of the prayer as an individual Bible teaching <coughs> uh, that Jesus is using when he's putting this prayer together. And so this prayer is a great way to show, uh, to share these scriptural doctrines and the true gospel message with our interested friends. I went to a Church of England school and the doctrines in this prayer contradict the doctrines taught by the mainstream churches and we'll consider more of that later. And so we'll start with just two words, our Father. Jesus, as the Son of God, has every right to call him Father. But do we? Uh, remember, this is the way that Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And it is consistent with his teaching uh, so far to, who's, to his disciples. Uh, turn back to, uh, just look over the page of chapter 5 um, and read verse 43. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples that they could be counted as the children of God. Um, and if we turn back to chapter 6, we go on to verse 26. Uh, we see this again. Uh, Jesus teaches them, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? <clears throat> and so if God sustains even the smallest of birds, will he not also care for those who look to him? And so we see God as this caring father. And Jesus often uses the Old Testament scriptures in his preaching. And the concept of God as a father is certainly found throughout the Old Testament, but is only rarely used by someone directly referring to God as their father. And this is found in the Psalms. Um, the first, Psalm 103, uh, is a simile of God as a father to those who fear or reverence him. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. The second is a conversation between God and his servant. Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And it, we can view this as a prophecy of, of the nature of Jesus Christ. Also in the Old Testament, God is referred to as a father of the nation of Israel. The first quote from Deuteronomy, uh, where Moses is calling for the nation of Israel to see God for how great he is. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that bought thee? 
Hath he not made thee and established thee? God, the father of his creation, the father of this nation which he had brought out of Egypt to establish them as a people in their own land. They had been bought, a word that also means to be redeemed. He was their redeemer. And then in the prophecy of Hosea, uh, God describes them as his child, which he has called out of Egypt. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And so this is a type of them to be separated from the world, to be his beloved son. Um, Jesus refers to God as our father, and there's a collective sense to that word. It wasn't my father, it wasn't your father. Jesus refers to his disciples later on in his ministry as his brethren. And he calls us to be part of the family of God through his sacrifice. And so this prayer has a future application, a future hope and promise of his kingdom where God can be our father as he was, as he is Christ's. And the Apostle Paul writes this in Romans that we can be called the sons of God and if sons uh, and if children or sons then heirs, heirs to the promises made to the faithful men in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. I'm sure we've heard many talks about those from this platform. And it is a family line that stretches back from Christ all the way to Adam, who is described as the son of God in the genealogy. And so by the process of baptism into the saving name of Jesus Christ, we can be part of this family as well. And so having considered God as a father, we, uh, as an intimate relationship, we are then reminded of God's power, which art in heaven. We are, uh, he's the almighty creator in heaven. And we have this image, don't we, of this, of this huge void of, of, between us and the sky, the, the heavens, um, between us and God, for he is far above all the thinking of man. As it says in Isaiah, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we have this contrast between the almighty God and the limitations of man. And yet this vast distance between us and God also highlights his immense power. Turn with me to uh, Psalm 103. Uh, we looked at this psalm just a bit earlier. And this psalm does have a lot of links to the uh, Lord's Prayer. Psalm 103. And let's jump into verse 7. He, had, he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. And we saw this from our previous references in Deuteronomy, how that Moses reminds the people of God's love towards them in bringing them out of bondage in the land of Egypt. And he makes known his ways, which are higher than our ways. He makes known his character. And this is a vital part of the message of the Lord's Prayer. And indeed the whole Bible, the character of God that we are to follow, as described here in verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And just how great is that mercy? Verse 11, for as the heaven is higher above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As vast as this gulf is uh, between us and God, God's mercy and love is greater by far. And so as we pray, we are reminded of God's power and his love towards us, that he will listen to our prayers from on high. And so we come on to the next line. Hallowed be thy name. And there's a lot of significance in God's name, Yahweh. We, we Definitely don't have time to talk about that now. But it speaks of a purpose, of, of his purpose of salvation. And um, we read earlier in the prophecy of Hosea that God had called them, his people, out of Egypt. He had called them away from their idols. And how this is a type of being uh, called to be separate from the worldly things that are opposed to God. And this is what he says to them in Leviticus. Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy and so God wanted them to follow his ways to be holy or separate from the ways of Egypt and one of the ten commandments that he gives is to not take God's name in vain and that is how sanctified that is how holy it is and we might imagine now uh, a, a policeman I'm sure they probably don't say this anymore but they stop in the name of the law and they are representatives of that law and so we, if we want to be representatives of God, 
we need to sanctify his holy name. And this is not just uh, an Old Testament teaching, but the Apostle Peter also teaches us to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. And so filling ourselves with the things of God, which then creates this good conscience, this good way of life in us. And there is again the connection to our future and our hope. So turn with me just to Isaiah 29. We believe that there will be a day when God's name will be known throughout the whole earth. When all nations will come to God to learn of his ways and to learn peace. Verse 18 starts, and in that day, and that indicates that this will be a future time. Uh, Throughout the Bible, it often refers to when God's kingdom is going to be established on the earth. And we read on verse 18 that the deaf will hear the words of the book. The eyes of the blind shall see. Verse 19, the meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. And so verse 22, we we see God. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham. We saw how he redeemed them out of the land of Egypt. And he will do so again. And the end point, verse 23 Uh, halfway through the verse they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the holy one of jacob and shall fear the god of israel and so this kingdom age will be centered around the worship of god and the glory of god uh, shall fill the earth as the waters cover the sea and it is this kingdom that jesus teaches us to pray for next jesus later in the chapter uh, with the lord's prayer goes on to teach us to seek first the kingdom of God, and not to worry about tomorrow, to teach us to trust in God and in his promises. But what is the kingdom of God? We have seen a few verses already that hint to these last days when God's name will be known and sanctified throughout the whole earth. So turn with me to Acts chapter 1. The events uh, here in Acts are during the 40 days in which uh, Jesus stays with his disciples after his death and subsequent resurrection. And Jesus is teaching them about the kingdom of God. We see that at the end of verse 3 and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And the disciples ask a question in verse 6, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And so this indicates that there was speculation about Jesus setting up the kingdom then and there, and they call it, or refer to it, as the kingdom of Israel. And we've seen a few verses, haven't we, uh, about how God has brought, brought his people out of Egypt, and he establishes them as a nation in the land of Israel, and he sets over them a king to lead them in the ways of God. And King David was chosen. Uh, to replace his predecessor, and he is described as being a man after God's own heart. And he is an ancestor of the Lord Jesus. And these kings were to be spiritual leaders over the nation of Israel, to lead them in the worship of God. And David says these words in relation to the kingdom of Israel. He, God, hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. It was God's kingdom. But by the time Jesus was born, uh, Judea was ruled over by the Romans. And many hoped that Jesus would overthrow this oppressive rule and re-establish the kingdom of Israel. So if you're still in Acts, we read on to find that Jesus does not establish the kingdom at this time. Verse 9, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And the cloud received him out of their sight, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so we believe that there will be this time 
when Jesus shall return. And we believe it will happen very soon. We see the events around us all over the world that are causing distress and uncertainty more than perhaps ever before. We are still, after over two years, struggling with this virus that seems to be beating every vaccine that comes along. And we see huge unrest caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And these are all signs of the soon return of Jesus to this earth to set up God's kingdom. For nearly 2,000 years, Jesus has had his disciples praying for God's kingdom to come. And this is not a failed promise, but God has been taking his time to bring these events to a head. Uh, and we should take heart that God has given us time to respond to his word. As he says, in, uh, as Jesus says to his disciples, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom to those who choose to follow his ways. Which brings us uh, to the next line, thy will be done. All of these things will happen as God plans. Each of us makes plans every day. Sometimes you might say, God willing, but they are still our plans that we want to do. But God has greater plans for us, as we have seen his plan of salvation through Jesus Christ that will ultimately lead to the glory of the kingdom. And this is what uh, Jesus says in John. And this is the will of him that sent me and everyone, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And so this is God's will, to bring about his salvation. But God does require a response from us. Uh, Jesus was the ultimate example of someone who submitted to the will of God. And here he is inviting us to join the family of God, to be counted as Jesus' brother. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. But it requires us to submit to God's will and then to follow his ways. And so this prayer then reflects the understanding that all that we ask for is in accordance with God's will. And also that we are acknowledging the salvation that comes with doing God's will, following his commandments, uh, and to show the characteristics that he has revealed to us. And so the next phrase, uh, in earth as it is in heaven, is often just applied to the third line, often just, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. But surely it can be applied to all three of the last uh, uh, phrases. Hallowed be thy name in earth as it is in heaven. And so currently God's name is glorified in the heavens by the angels. And one day, as we have seen, it will be sanctified throughout the whole earth. Thy kingdom come in earth as it is in heaven. We have just seen that Jesus will descend like a cloud and establish God's heavenly kingdom. Here on the earth, there is no mention of any heaven ascension for his disciples anywhere in this prayer. And we know God's will will be done on earth by, by us now, but also on a grand scale when he establishes the kingdom of God on the earth. And so we move on to uh, uh, some more of the petition part. And we could easily think, great, now we can ask for whatever we want. But Jesus' request is very clear. He didn't ask for riches and wealth, but just enough uh, and to have the faith that we will have. Not necessarily what we want, but what we need. And Jesus goes on to teach his disciples not to worry about tomorrow. I say to you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is life not more than meat and the body more than raiment? Uh, but they should trust in the caring Father who sustains even the birds of the air. And this alludes back to the time when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and God gave them bread every day, but only enough to live off for that day. They learned to trust and to have faith in God that he would provide. And the next phrase then highlights the need for forgiveness. And this could be our spiritual needs. And we will not always get it right, will we, 100% of the time. We all sin, and sin, the disobedience of God's commandments, where we all short fall, fall short of the standards that he has set out. And with only one exception, the Lord Jesus Christ, no one is without sin. But we believe that God is just, 
that he is merciful, that he will forgive us our sins if we repent and confess our sins through prayer. As uh, it says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. And we also have the responsibility to forgive each other, not to hold grudges. And so if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, there is no comparison really between what God forgives us and what we should forgive others for. Matthew 18. Verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Till seven times. And so this is a classic question, isn't it? How many times do I have to do the right thing to swallow how upset I am and to forgive my brother? And Jesus responds and says unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times Seven, And so Jesus responds way beyond their expectations. And surely this is not a literal number of times we should forgive, but it demonstrates that we should forgive always as God, as we hope God would forgive us. And Jesus goes on to teach them a parable about a Lord who forgives a massive debt. And we could estimate that nowadays about three million pounds. But then that servant demands his return on someone indebted to him, and that debt was only worth £30. And so we read in verse 32, Then this his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. And so we learn from this prayer the lesson of sin and and death, the need for forgiveness, and also to teach us how to live with one another. And he goes on, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this clause on temptation is interesting because... We learn elsewhere, as you can see in James, uh, that the times of hardship shape our character to be more like God's. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So why then should we ask not to be led into temptation? Perhaps this isn't a request for an easier time of it in our daily lives, but rather an acknowledgement of our weak nature, which leads us into temptations. This prayer then is more, this prayer for us to be more like Jesus, who resisted his temptation. We also learn that God will not tempt us more than we can bear. Again, we have this caring nature of our Father in heaven. And nowhere in this is there mention of a supernatural entity who draws us away from God. The idea of the devil is simply not there. And there's another side to this clause on temptation and deliverance from evil. While in the present we wish to be guided in our trials and temptations, we also look to the future when our human nature will be changed to no longer draw us into temptation. And so it says, we read in Philippians, for our conversation is from heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that uh, it be not me, uh, fashioned like unto his glorious body. The word conversation refers to the way of life uh, that they follow. And in this case, uh, following God's way that he has set out in the Bible. And in the kingdom, we believe that we will be made like unto the Lord Jesus in glorious immortality. And so there's not a simple request to not be tempted, but a prayer looking forward to the future elements of God's plan and purpose. And so Jesus ends the prayer with these words, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And it is striking how similar it is to to a prayer given by King David when he is preparing to hand over the throne of the kingdom of Israel to his son Solomon. He says, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, 
the address that he then gives to the nation is one of rejoicing. That the temple of God was ready to be built and his son Solomon would then continue this work so that God would have a permanent house of worship in the land of Israel. And this was truly the height of the majesty of the nation of Israel. And so God, Jesus chooses his words well to emphasize this longing for that glory to return to the land and when God would once again dwell with man. And so this whole prayer then is dedicated not just to how we should be living our lives uh, in now in godly reverence, but also how we should be looking forward uh, to the time when the Lord Jesus will return, the descendant of the royal line of David, to prepare the whole earth for God to once again dwell with man on earth forever and ever, a time we hope will come soon. And so the question for you now is, are you ready?